Order, members. We're now moving on to uh, questions to the Minister for the Economy, and I call Ms. Rachel Woods. Question number one. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member uh, for her question. The finding in the University of Exeter report is solely the opinion of the authors and is based on a small number of interviews. It is correct that there is an obligation on the department and the utility regulator to promote the natural gas industry. Natural gas is an important element of the energy mix in Northern Ireland, facilitating significant carbon reduction as businesses and households switch to gas from more polluting fossil fuels. To date, over 285,000 consumers have connected to gas, but with two-thirds of households here still using oil as their main source of heating, further gas connections can contribute greatly towards reducing carbon emissions in Northern Ireland on a continuing basis. Looking forward, my department's consultation uh, on policy options for a new energy, added, uh, energy strategy states that our gas networks which are more modern than those in Great Britain and are expected to be able to accommodate zero carbon gas without requiring extensive upgrades, can have an ongoing role to play in contributing to net zero carbon energy. Consideration is being given to how both biogas and hydrogen injection to the gas grid could be facilitated, ensuring that our gas network remains valuable assets on the energy decarbonisation pathway to 2020. Oh, I beg pardon. Did, did I call Ms. Woods for a supplementary? No, I'm terribly sorry. Ms. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, when I asked the Deputy First Minister about this report, she said the outworking of such a report has to have more executive discussion. So, can I ask the Minister to confirm whether she has or intends to bring the key findings and recommendations to the executive? And after having roughly six months to review it, what decisions and plans she has had to make regarding the implementation of the recommendations? Well, of course, I am uh, entirely happy and um, at ease uh, with uh, forwarding the report to executive uh, colleagues for their information. However, the um, part and the, the, the part of the, the energy development strategy in our department that is most important is the consultation that has just been issued, the responses to the consultation that will be evaluated, and the new energy strategy, which of course will have the imprimatur of the executive when it is published later this year. That is the most important document that we will be delivering in terms of our energy strategy for Northern Ireland, a document that will lead us on the pathway to decarbonisation, to net zero by 2050, um, and also to um, giving us that green economic recovery that will dovete dovetail with my economic recovery action plan. I call the Deputy Chair of the Committee, Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Speaker. Uh, Minister, thank you for your answer so far. Would it not be prudent that for your department um, to suspend the pr promotion of fossil fuels at this particular moment in time? Because if, you know, it, it has been devalued in, in, uh, in, in uh, our long-term development plans. So, and we need to lead Northern Ireland to that green new energy and to meet the commitments of, of uh, the, the, the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. So are we not really wasting our time now promoting those fossil fuels? Should we not be moving much quicker um, to, to, to green new energy? Uh, for fear of sounding repetitious from the previous round of questions, if we could have short, sharp, focused questions, we might get more answers. I call the Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy uh, Principal, Deputy Speaker, whatever way it works. Um, <laughs> can I thank the member for her question? And she has written uh, many uh, questions on this particular issue uh, into the department, and I understand her concern in this matter. But we are where we are, and gas 
um, and the, the, the system um, is a, an important transition fuel as Northern Ireland transitions on its way to um, decarbonisation by uh, 2050. Um, we still have two-thirds of households in Northern Ireland um, that uh, use oil um, and uh, heavily polluting um, fossil fuels. So we need to use what we have in the meantime. However, there is excellent news um, in uh, Northern Ireland's story so far in relation to renewables. Almost 50% of electricity generated in Northern Ireland comes from renewable sources. And we are continuing to make progress with that. And we have said that as a, as a starting point um, for the new energy strategy, we want not less than 70% of electricity to be generated through renewable sources. Those are important targets on our way uh, to 2050. Um, and I look forward to working with uh, the Vice Chair of the Committee and indeed the whole Committee um, on this very, very important issue where I think Northern Ireland can be a world leader. I call the Chair of the Committee, Dr Kiva Archibald. And I thank the Minister for her responses so far. The Minister, you will be aware that, amongst other things, one of the statutory ob objectives of the utility regulator is to protect the long and short term interests of consumers. In the context of the new energy strategy, have you given consideration to an additional duty to promote decarbonisation? Because obviously there is going to be investment required in um, renewable energy. Um, and that's an absolute imperative to, uh, to decarbonisation. Come over. Thank you. Um, and we have had some preliminary discussion with uh, the utility regulator around a whole um, range of areas where his remit might be strengthened, um, in not just around decarbonisation, but indeed uh, around gas and a, and a wider range of areas. It is something that we plan to take forward, obviously in consultation uh, with the regulator, um, but we do think that it is important, and we think it is important, and as a core value of our strategy going forward, we want energy that is affordable and that has the consumer at its heart. Mr. Stuart Dixon. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, um, you have launched a review into energy strategy for Northern Ireland, but would you agree with me that it has perhaps had a rather unauspicious uh, start by uh, alleged reports that certain uh, critical lines within the report from Exeter University were removed at the request of your department? Well, I absolutely uh, do not accept. Um, I'm, I'm presuming um, what you're talking about is the um, policy options consultation on the new energy strategy for Northern Ireland. And indeed, um, that has an enormous range of support right across uh, the board and across many business organisations in Northern Ireland that can see the potential for that green economic recovery that we need uh, to have here and that we will build back better after the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, in terms of the Exeter report, which is, of course is entirely different, um, I would have to say that the author of the same report said that uh, obviously all reports are fact-checked. This is normal practice and did not in any shape or form impact on the outcome. Mr. Mcnesbitt. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, <clears throat> Minister, does the, can the grid handle 70 per cent of energy coming from renewables, and if not, what, what quantum of investment would be required to facilitate that? Can I uh, again thank the member uh, for his uh, question? He poses a very important um, question and one which Sony uh, themselves talked about in their recent uh, uh, paper that they have published. And of course, we do need and will need to upgrade uh, the grid and to ensure that the grid is fit for purpose. We also need to ensure that uh, the generation and the sale and the distribution of electricity in Northern Ireland is done for the benefit of Northern Ireland consumers. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Good case at all. Question two, please. Again, um, can I thank the member for his question? COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on our economy. 
and as Economy Minister, it is my duty to ensure that there is a plan in place to support recovery. I moved quickly to develop and publish my Economic Recovery Action Plan, which has been strongly endorsed by stakeholders and the wider business community. The member will be aware that the Finance Minister recently announced the allocation of £286 million to fully fund my Economic Recovery Action Plan. This includes £145 million for the High Street Stimulus Scheme, which will encourage spend in local towns and city centres. This is a clear demonstration of the priority placed on economic recovery by the Executive. I am, of course, aware that economic recovery will not be delivered by my department alone, and I support the Communities Minister in welcoming £27 million allocation from the Executive, which will be primarily used by her department to deliver the local version of the Kickstart scheme. Recovery is at the heart of the work being taken forward by the Executive Task Force. As part of this work, departments have been asked to consider the actions needed to drive the recovery process forward. My Economic Recovery Action Plan provides a comprehensive, fully developed contribution to this process. Mr. Shane. I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, hello. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether she actually answered the question or not. Uh, nevertheless, one glaring omission in the action plan is a failure to identify and build on uh, cross-border trade. And I wonder if I could ask the Minister, is that owing to the objections of her party to growing uh, cross-border cooperation and trade rather than the needs and interests of businesses that she should be supporting? Um, Perhaps I should um, enlighten the member um, and indicate that my party has always supported um, trade um, and for companies to trade across the border um, when it is applicable and useful for them to do so. Um, he will also understand that in my department I also sponsor uh, and work very closely with Intertrade Ireland which of course um, has been very um, busy in supporting businesses, not just um, in uh, the COVID pandemic, but also in trying to unravel the myriad uh, of rules and regulations that the protocol that his party supports has uh, foisted upon businesses, and which every week I am now writing to Lord Frost uh, in London to report the specific issues that businesses uh, are reporting to me. Mr. Matthew Toole. Thank you. Um, and just in relation to the protocol, uh, Minister, uh, the protocol, while certainly imperfect, offers us opportunity, as Invest NI, your own agency says, to be at the gateway of two markets. It offers us a unique competitive advantage. And while imperfect, and we didn't want it in the first place, we didn't want Brexit, it offers us some opportunity. Would you agree with me that images of riots on the streets? Uh, are cities um, being uh, subject to petrol bombing and rioting is deterring inward investors, investors who are looking again at this society because of our unique position vis-à-vis -vis the protocol. We have heard from specific investors who have been deterred from investing. Would she agree with me that political stability is necessary Question. to attract investment, and the protocol is part of that? Would she call for political stability in order to generate investment? Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to take the opportunity, and I think it is important to say yet again um, as a minister um, in the executive that violence was wrong whenever and wherever it occurs. It was wrong in the past, and it is wrong now, and I would call on people to desist. I actually, as someone um, who knows these areas very, very well, um, find it very disturbing to see what has happened in those areas um, over the last number of weeks. I, as my, the Minister for the Economy, and particularly because I am um, very keen to promote skills and jobs and training in all parts of Northern Ireland, have visited Lanark Way and Impact Training there, who do a tremendous amount of work. And I'm really happy to report to the House that the new Shankle Falls Women's Centre, which is being built in Lanark Way, will soon be finished um, and opening uh, for business there as well. So I do hope 
that uh, people desist from violence. It serves no purpose but to bring misery to communities. Um, in relation to inward investment, um, I have uh, spoken, of course, with uh, InvestNI on this issue over recent days, and there is no evidence uh, that at this minute in time uh, that there is any off-putting uh, in relation uh, to inward investment. Indeed, we have been very busy uh, with some potential investors uh, for Northern Ireland, and I look forward to working with them to see the fruits of that uh, coming to Northern Ireland. In relation to the protocol, um, and I do um, sort of commend the member on his persistence in this particular point, um, the protocol, uh, while giving us access to um, the EU market, also brings with it a huge amount of problems for our access for our greatest and most important market, that market being Great Britain. I'll say it again, it's worth repeating. We buy more and sell more to Great Britain than we do in any other market Minister's throughout time. the world. I'll, I'll just finish with one uh, last thought. Um, so, therefore, it is absolutely important that we deal with the issues of the protocol and week in and week out now. I am writing to government about those issues, not just from small firms, but some of our biggest and best and most eminent firms in Northern Ireland. Um, the Minister is within her rights at any point to ask for an extra minute, so that's okay. Um, Mr. Gary Middleton. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, I think it is in the Minister's uh, credit that the Economic Recovery Plan has received such positive uh, comments from right across uh, the stakeholders and the business representative bodies. I welcome the fact that that has now been fully funded by the Executive. Uh, does the Minister agree with me that alongside that Economic Recovery Plan, it is important uh, that we now see a reopening of our, of our economy and that we provide clear dates for our businesses to reopen in a safe manner? Yes, can I uh, thank the member for his question, which is not just topical but absolutely of paramount importance this week. Um, the economic recovery plan on its own is not uh, of great use unless we have an open and functioning economy. And what we need now, um, and I am thankful, and I know members in this House are thankful for the reduction in the transmission, for the vaccine rollout programme, but what we need now are clear dates so that we can reopen our economy, give businesses certainty, and allow them to plan that reopening. That will then allow us to uh, go forward with the actions in the Economic Recovery Plan, which are designed to help us to rebuild and recover after the damage of COVID. Mr. Andrew Muir. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, the recovery is essential, but it must be a green recovery. What work is the Minister doing to ensure, as part of those recovery plans, that it is focused upon our green recovery, especially in liaison with her other executive colleagues? Again, um, can I thank the member for his question. The member will know um, from my economic recovery plan that that green recovery is one of the four fundamental pillars of that economic recovery plan. Not only will that lead us to a more sustainable environment, will it tackle climate change, but I believe that it will help us to grow jobs and prosperity in Northern Ireland. We are already um, doing uh, some of those things, um, and there are many new uh, and exciting developments in research and innovation projects, such as Artemis, which will uh, bring to fruition that really uh, ambitious green recovery um, programme uh, that Northern Ireland needs and seeks. Dr. Steve Aiken. Uh, question three, please. With your permission, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I wish to group uh, questions three and four. And also, with your permission, Mr. Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker, I wish to avail of an extra minute to answer this grouping. I can confirm that payments to eligible businesses under the COVID restrictions business support scheme and large tourism and hospitality business support scheme will continue while restrictions remain in place. Whilst grant support has been a lifeline for many businesses, it cannot last indefinitely. The best way to support businesses is to get them operating again. I am of the view that the safe reopening of businesses should happen as soon as possible. 
On the 25th of February, I published my Economic Recovery Action Plan, which sets out a range of decisive actions <coughs> excuse me, to stick, kick start the econ economic recovery as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to reprioritising funds within my existing budget, I have also secured an additional £286 million from the Executive, which will allow me to deliver my recovery action plan in full. It is, however, important to recognise that recovery will not be completed in one year alone, and many of the actions set out within this plan will require funding beyond 2021-22. The action plan includes the High Street Stimulus Scheme, which officials are developing in order to provide a much welcome boost to the local economy. I look forward to announcing more details about the scheme in due course. Dr. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Minister for her comments so far? Uh, obviously, in sort of the Northern Ireland, the tourism and hospitality sector is vitally important. And as the success of the vaccination programme rolls out, there is a great opportunity for staycations in Northern Ireland and the ability across our islands to use our place as a destination where we can really push our economy to do that as well. Could the Minister outline any plans she has for the promotion of Northern Ireland, particularly in our centenary year, and particularly as a great place to visit if we are going to be sticking to staycations? Can I thank the member for his question? And I, like you, think that Northern Ireland is a great place to live, to work, and indeed to visit. Um, and um, I've spoken much about my economic recovery action plan uh, in this chamber today. And of course, within that, we have um, some funding for tourism uh, Northern Ireland uh, for a, a staycation voucher scheme uh, for Northern Ireland, which I hope to roll out um, in uh, the reasonably near future. We also will be doing um, promotion of Northern Ireland as a wonderful place to stay and visit um, in both uh, the Republic of Ireland and with Tourism Ireland in uh, the Great Britain market. All of our research suggests that people will be more comfortable travelling um, within the British Isles over uh, the next number of months. And we want our businesses to be able to take advantage of that. Um, and uh, to have a good summer uh, season, which is absolutely essential. But of course, to do that, the need to open, and the need to open successfully, safely, and above all, soon. And they need a timeline to do that. Mr. Alan Chambers. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer so far. Uh, can I ask the Minister whether she is planning any additional bids to the Minister of Finance? for financial support schemes to assist businesses in the wedding sector uh, in their financial recovery from the impact of COVID-19. Thank you. Can I thank the member for his question? And undoubtedly, um, he, like myself and many others in this chamber, um, have been uh, lobbied and uh, spoken to by a number of, of uh, sectors within the economy that have been terribly um, impacted by uh, the pandemic. Can I say, first of all, that the best thing that we can do for business is to allow it to reopen, restart and get on with doing what it does best. The wedding sector specifically met with officials from my department this week um, and they were talking about the problems that they have encountered in that reopening. First of all, they need the ability to plan. And that is absolutely hugely important and plan uh, the way forward. Um, we will, of course, continue to support and sustain businesses, but reopening is key to making the economy work. I heard this morning on the radio that over 3,000 weddings, I think it was the hotel sector, were um, interviewed, that there is a backlog of over 3,000 weddings that will take place in Northern Ireland this summer. It's a huge industry and, of course, personally very important to many. Mr. John O'Dowd. Okay, uh, just on the subjects of weddings, uh, you all know Fran McCann. He, he got married yesterday to his lifelong partner, Jeanette. I think he waited to the lockdown because he didn't want to buy any of his dinner. <laughs> but that, 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 that's a different matter. Uh, and in terms of, of economic support for businesses, Minister, many businesses have found it difficult, if, if not impossible, to wade their way through the different schemes that are out there in, in your department. Is your department considering expanding or changing the criteria of those schemes to ensure that as many businesses as possible receive support? 
Well, first of all, um, I, I will pass on my congratulations to Fran McCann, um, and I suppose it's better late than never in that, in, in that sense, um, but we wish him well. Um, the issue around schemes, um, as you understand, is complex, costly, um, and really what we need for businesses to do is to be able to reopen, and to reopen as soon as possible. I was talking to um, businesses within my within Banbridge, my local um, hometown, um, and they were indicating to me the sales they had lost since Christmas um, because of the restrictions and the need to shut down non-essential retail. No grant, no amount of money that we can give at people, no matter how valuable that is and how important that is, will replace reopening the economy. And many of those businesses, particularly retail, really need to see that date, the need to see that timeline, the need to know that they can reopen. Many of them are just getting in spring stock. I spoke to one young uh, shop owner in Portadown who was really distressed by the fact that she didn't know how this stock was either going to be paid for or sold unless she was given some hope. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Thank you again, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I agree with the Minister on the importance of our hospitality trade. It, will she be engaging with the Communities Minister on the licensing bill, which is currently going through? At the minute, we have a very regressive, unreformed old licensing system, which is driving rural pubs to shut, and that's damaging our tourism offer. But second, would she agree with me? I agree with her that we want to attract tourists from across the UK and Ireland. But would she agree with me that the last thing, the thing that's guaranteed to keep those tourists away, is looking at their screens and seeing a summer of protest in Northern Ireland? We need them to come here, and, and, and we need them not to be seeing that on their screens. Again, can I thank the member for his question? Um, and one thing that I think that we should be very clear about is that Northern Ireland is a peaceful, largely prosperous uh, society that is very resilient and with communities across uh, Northern Ireland that are very resilient and have withstood an enormous amount uh, of uh, violence uh, over the years that has been foisted upon them. We now need to move into that positive space where we are talking about opportunity, where we are talking about the needs of an economy that actually has uh, reinvented itself over the last number of years into uh, one of the most promising tech economies in Europe. Um, Belfast, I think, was one, rated one of the best tech cities uh, in the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, and we need to make sure that that positive message of Northern Ireland goes out while dealing with the political and social problems that may lead to unrest. So I want us to have a perspective of what I believe is an absolutely brilliant place to live, work and do business. Claire Shugden. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for her answers. Um, I agree with the Minister. I think businesses need to be opening as soon as possible. But in her responses, there are suggestions that others within the executive are tentative about reopening. So given that the rate of, of infection is significantly going down, what reasons are being given by her executive colleagues to continue staying closed? Well, I wouldn't want to preempt any executive discussion um, or um, discuss the business of the executive. But some um, are, and we understand this, because our community here in Northern Ireland has suffered enormously through COVID. I was talking to uh, one member today who was telling me of one family in his uh, constituency who buried three members within four or five weeks of each other. Those are, are dreadful things for communities, families and individuals to have to face. So, of course, there is a lot of um, nervousness. But we have a tremendous uh, vaccine rollout programme. I think that everyone involved should be praised for that. Um, we have transmission rates that are now very low. And we cannot keep people um, locked down in their homes and in their houses uh, in the way that they've been doing. People have made enormous sacrifices. It's now time to reopen and regrow our economy and rebuild and recover uh, and work together to do that. And I look forward to working with others across this House in an effort to do that. Mr. Philip McGuigan. 
Again, can I thank the member uh, for his questions. I have not had any discussions with the Minister for Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science uh, in relation to North-South student uh, mobility. The most recent statistics for 2018-19 confirm that the total number of Northern Ireland domiciled students enrolled in higher education courses in the Republic of Ireland was 1,500. The total number of Republic of Ireland domiciled students enrolled at Northern Ireland higher education institutions was 2,245. The total number of Republic of Ireland domiciled students enrolled at higher education institutions in Great Britain was 7,375, and the total number of Northern Ireland domiciled students enrolled on higher education courses in Great Britain, including undergraduate and postgraduate, was 17,425. I'm afraid that ends the period for listed questions. Um, we now have to move on to topical questions and before I call the first member on the list for topical questions can I congratulate him on his recent uh, nuptials and if we could bring onto the screen the member from West Belfast Mr Fram Akam. Uh, and thank you uh, to yourself and the assembly for the for the, the well wishes that I uh, received. Uh, Minister uh, you will be aware that uh, taxi drivers and coach drivers are extremely important to our economy, in particular our tourism offering. However, workers in these sectors feel they are being constantly neglected by both your department and the Department for Infrastructure. If that is not the case, can you explain why w only one out of 49 applications to Part B of the Coronavirus Restrictions Business Support Scheme was successful? Again, um, I want to pass on my best wishes. Um, and uh, wish you um, and your wife uh, well for the future. Just to, just to um, years. The taxi drivers, coach drivers, coach operators um, have been taken under the wing of the Department of Infrastructure. It is largely the Department of Infrastructure that has administered the grant scheme, uh, which um, has been applicable to them. And should the member require, I would, of course, be happy to provide him with the exact figures in relation to that grant scheme. In relation to Part B of the CBRSS, I don't have the specific figures in front of me for taxi drivers. I'm happy and uh, taxi operators, I'm very, very happy uh, to supply them um, and will do so as soon as possible. Mr uh, McCann, for a supplementary. Sorry, uh, last one, Kulia. Uh, Minister, th 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 thank you for uh, your, your information thus far and uh, thank you again for your best wishes. It's just been a 39 year engagement, that's the way we look at it. But uh, your economic recovery, recovery strategy commits to extending apprenticeships to people of all ages. While this is welcome, would the Minister agree that many older people who are likely to have, a higher, have higher cost and commitments would find it impossible to survive on an apprentice wage of 430? Uh, an hour. And do you agree that the best way to address this kind of issue is by transferring the minimum wage powers in accordance with the new deal, new decade approach uh, commitments so that we can set our own incentives? Thank you. Well, first of all, um, again, I would have to say that apprenticeships, um, training, yeah. um, prospects for jobs um, and uh, for life are probably the most important thing that we can do to create a stable, prosperous Northern Ireland, giving people hope, the ability to earn a living um, and the ability to be part of society is, is a really important uh, thing that we can do for Northern Ireland. I spent some time this week, the member will be glad to know, talking to my officials uh, around uh, the issue of apprenticeships, how we can extend the apprenticeship uh, recovery and retraining and the new uh, apprenticeship package uh, right through this year and indeed into the next year and how hopefully I will be able to bring fairly soon uh, to the Assembly the news that we are able to open up apprenticeships to all ages. 
It is, of course, imperative that firms are also not just incentivized to take on apprentice, apprentices, but that apprentices can uh, earn appropriate uh, wages. Um, and we will look at all of those issues as we bring forward uh, the package on all age apprenticeships. Thank you very much. Ma'am. Thank you, Minister. And now, if we can uh, bring Mr. Daniel McCrossan remotely into the meeting. Mr. McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister uh, for the answers to the question so far. Uh, Minister, you'll be aware from various correspondence with myself and other SDLP MLAs that caravan owners from right across the North feel deeply aggrieved regarding the costs that they have incurred over the past year and significant fight, site fees ranging between two and three thousand pounds in some instances, despite not being able to use uh, their caravans. Can you, Minister, outline if you have engaged with the Minister for uh, Communities? Or what action has been taken uh, to ensure that all those with caravans are not severely financially disadvantaged due to COVID-19? Well, I, like uh, the member, have had an enormous amount of um, correspondence from caravan owners, some uh, who have had site fees partially returned last year um, and others who haven't. Um, those are contractual matters uh, for the individual and the site uh, owner, um, and uh, we should remember that. But by far the largest volume of correspondence that I receive um, from uh, caravan owners is to allow them to return uh, to using their caravans in a properly safe, COVID, socially distanced uh, way. I hope that we will be able to give them uh, some further information on that um, in the very uh, near future. And I know that many caravan owners that uh, correspond with me will be very glad to hear that. Mr. McCross, uh, for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for uh, her answer and for recognising uh, that there is a, a, an issue here. Uh, and Minister, I do understand that there is a contractual arrangement between caravan park owners and caravan owners, but there also is a responsibility in this House to ensure sufficient regulation to ensure that those caravan owners are protected and not abused. In some instances, there has been very few who have received uh, discounts at all, given that the caravan park owners have received government intervention. Does the Minister believe that there should be government intervention uh, for those caravan park uh, uh, caravan owners who have had to pay out thousands without accessing uh, their uh, mobile homes? Well, of course, as I have uh, said to the member, um, the contractual issue is one between the caravan owner and the site owner. Um, if uh, the, the site owner is amenable, then I think that uh, it is reasonable to assume that if you are unable to use your caravan, that you should be able uh, to have a discount in relation to that. Um, I have received no notification that Ms Sinead Bradley will be joining us remotely, and she is not in her place, so we will move then to Mr Justin McNulty. Minister, on the 25th of March, the Comptroller and Auditor General said at the Public Accounts Committee that your department were paying third-level institutions a 10 per cent fee to administer the £500 student grant that I am happy to say the SDLP led the campaign for. Given that 40,000 students are eligible for that grant, can the Minister confirm that this, this is actually the case? The COVID disruption payment was uh, a unique opportunity to support students uh, here uh, who uh, attend uh, institutions within Northern Ireland. And of course, um, in order uh, for us to be able to give that payment out, which is unique, um, we uh, had to ask the universities themselves to do that, since they would have access to the appropriate information uh, to make the payment. It is important that we acknowledge that universities um, would incur cost in relation to that, um, and that they are um, remunerated uh, in relation to it. Mr. McNulty. Thank you for your answer so far, Minister. Minister, that means that £2 million has been paid to universities to administer that fee. Do you not think that that money will be wiser spent on those students who have excluded from that scheme, those students studying in Britain, those students studying down south, those students studying further afield? And can you advise when will those students be included in the scheme? 
Well, of course, the member is absolutely aware um, that uh, we did take advice um, on the remit uh, for students uh, studying in Great Britain or indeed students studying in the Republic of Ireland. We supported the students and the institutions that we publicly fund here in Northern Ireland. And of course, students who are in Great Britain, students who are in Northern Ireland, will be able to claim uh, funding from the university that they attend. I think in Scotland, um, something like 30 million additional was made available for student hardship. I know that in England, just recently, an additional 50 million was made available for student hardship. And in Wales, something in the region of 40 million was made available for student hardship. Ms. Karen Mullen. Ask Ian Collier and thank the Minister for answers so far. Minister, I wanted to ask if there was an underspend in your department's £10.6 million allocation to the Wet Pubs support scheme, um, and if you would consider, or if you are going to consider supporting Wet Pubs going forward if trading is limited when they reopen? The Wet Pubs uh, scheme um, was based on the number of pubs that were identified as being within that category. Um, by uh, the finance department and um, the, the, through the, the local rates um, schemes, so um, we were given the number from those uh, area, from those schemes. Um, when uh, we actually apply our wrote to those uh, particular um, businesses, many of them had been able to open and declared that they had been open for part of the summer and therefore would not be eligible and would not meet the criteria of the scheme. I will be happy, of course, to write to the member with the exact figures in relation to um, the uptake of the scheme um, and uh, as to how that has worked out. But I do commend those who forthrightly said we were open during that period, even if only in a limited way. Um, and I think that that is uh, commendable and very, very important for us to recognise. Um, going forward, um, we really do want to see businesses to be open, to be viable um, and to open safely. And as I've said many times in the last number of minutes in this House, we need to give those uh, businesses a date for reopening as soon as we possibly can. Ms Mullen. Thank the Minister for her answer in relation to that. Um, Minister, unfortunately there is a growing concern in Derry that you are less than enthusiastic around um, fulfilling the commitment for the McGee expansion that is a new decade, new approach. Therefore, could I ask you to provide an update on any engagements and work with the Austria University in regarding to the commitment um, and delivering on that expansion to 10,000 10, students at the campus? Yeah, can I thank the member, and I will write to you ex very specifically with all of the details in relation uh, to my engagement uh, with Ulster University and indeed in relation to the McGee campus. Um, it is, of course, for the Department of Health to identify need, to do the business case, and we will, of course, administer that in relation to the medical school. Everything is progressing, as far as I'm aware, uh, on time uh, and in an appropriate way, and I haven't uh, been notified of any kind of bumps along the road. Just recently, um, I uh, actually signed off uh, on the strategic outline business cases uh, for two projects. Uh, for the McGee, um, which are being delivered in relation uh, to the city deals. Both of these projects are worth in the region of 50 million to the university and will substantially increase its ability and its research uh, base at, uh, that, uh, at that location. But of course, Ulster University is also a three campus university, um, and we would like to see their plan in relation to all of the campuses. Um, across the university sites. Ms Claire Shogden. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, can she give us any indication uh, when FE colleges will return to face-to-face -to -face teaching in line with the schools that returned earlier this week? Yes. Um, can I again thank the member? This is a really important issue for many um, FE uh, learners um, and for those associated uh, with the colleges. And I hope that after Thursday's executive, there will be definite um, dates in, in, in the pipeline. Of course, FE colleges have been open 
um, throughout for those who needed to do practical subjects and um, had to um, uh, go in to do that, and, some, uh, and the rest was taught with remote learning. However, as we come up to those very, very crucial professional exams, um, many of those young people need to have the practical experience that they require in order to pass those exams. So if you think, for example, of young people who are studying uh, health and social care or young people who are studying hairdressing or whatever it is they're studying, because their part of the economy has been closed, it's been very difficult for those young people to gain the practical experience that they need in order to progress. And we need to work urgently to make sure that those young people can all succeed and get their qualifications as they need to uh, in the summer. Ms. Sultan. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I forgot to declare an interest in this area. My husband is a college le lecturer, but I'm not asking for him. I am actually asking on behalf of a constituent who is concerned that her daughter had chosen an FE, an FE pathway instead of going to sixth form. And she's worried, is there, are, are they being disadvantaged because sixth formers are now back at school, but um, FE uh, students are not? So um, I look forward to dates on Thursday, hopefully. Um, but, but I think it's important that no one is disadvantaged in our school system, whether it's it. Can, I, can I just say, I absolutely agree with you. I, I think that our FE colleges um, are absolutely amazing places of learning. They're not just about learning, they're about a whole community of people who are at that uh, college um, and such a, a, a broad range of people, people who are doing foundation degrees uh, to some of the most vulnerable young people um, in our society. No one should be disadvantaged, and this uh, executive in this House should be concerned uh, about the future for young people. That is the future of Northern Ireland. We must work to build it. Thank you, members. That concludes questions to the Economy Minister. Uh, item number five on the adjournment paper, or beg pardon, item number five on the order paper uh, is the adjournment. The question is that the House do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned.